Yeah, we're pretty well. Um, we may have lost one or two, but um, okay. let's just continue on and they'll, sure. they'll probably make it back too. So, sure. Thanks for so, working with me. <laughs> uh, I get it. I've had to do this before, so this isn't the first time I've had this come up. So, um, so it, bottom line is, um, you know, this is going to be a process. And it, so the timeline on this is in January, they came out with these tentative maps. In September of this year, they're supposed to send a first revision to those maps. Um, I, you know, and, uh, until I see them, I won't know, right? Um, we'll see how much that changes. Once that revision is done in September, it's probably going to be the one that sticks, um, in the, the September one. And then the process starts where the, the um, um, where the, the government, the FEMA, will, will start their process of um, the city being able to do changes. If we get mitigation plans in, we can do changes for up to six months. And then they're gonna say, okay, now we're cutting it off. And if you do any changes um, after this, you're gonna to have to apply for a letter of map revision. So the target date is supposed to be winter 23, 24 for these new maps to go into effect. So I was talking with a gentleman um, who was part of FEMA for 50 years and who has a huge wealth of knowledge. And he sat in on a meeting with me and he advised me that he doesn't think it will actually happen this quickly simply because Post pandemic, um, they've had a lot of people leave and retire. Um, and so it is possible that um, they may not have the staffing at FEMA to get this completed in their, their own timeline because of this. Because they have specific engineers that have to look at this mapping and make sure everything is accurate and double check everything before it goes in. And apparently um, three, there are three major people of that and all three have left in the last couple months. So I don't know if this is an accurate timeline now because of it. I think we have to go on the premise that it is. And if it gets delayed, yay, it gives us more time to get some work done. Um, I'd love to see that happen. Uh, if there's more mitigation that could be done in the meantime by the city um, or by getting these grants, et cetera. But I, you know, can't count on it. So, so bottom line is um, these rates um, are not pretty. Um, at 100,000, you might be paying $2,900, depending on where you are and your amount you have to carry. Um, it, it, you know, it, if you have to carry the full 250,000, um, you know, the, the numbers that I quoted earlier are not out of, the, the, those are legit numbers I ran on legit houses. They weren't faked. So, um, I, you know, not here to scare anybody just to make realization that um, if, you, if you have, and so here's something I would suggest, okay? You can call your agent now. And you can have them write a flood insurance quote for you now. So let's say you have a mortgage right now for 150,000 and you call your agent and say, I wanna know what flood insurance is gonna cost me, 150,000 right now. Obviously you're not in a flood zone right now, but you know you're going to be, right? It doesn't matter anymore because the rate doesn't change. So the new rates that came out in October no longer change when you become in a flood zone. So instead of having these rates that we used to have where you could get uh, a $636 rate and get 250,000 because you were in a uh, non-flood hazard area, those have all gone away. Um, so people that already had flood insurance can keep those and they will 
go up 18% a year until they get to the max rate. Anybody coming in new, uh, they're gonna pay full rate. Unless you buy a house where someone had flood insurance, in which case, you know, there's a possibility that you can take that policy over. But for the rest of us, if you call now, you can get a flood rate. You can find out what it's gonna be so that you at least have some idea what it's going to be in a couple of years. Um, it'll give you a good benchmark. And so that is totally doable. Um, if you want to purchase it now, uh, I'm not here to tell you you shouldn't have flood insurance. I just know that a lot of people, this is an affordability issue, right? Um, so my, my guess is that, you know, most are not going to do it till you have to, but in order to know what you have as options, ask them to quote it and ask them to quote it in FEMA and in other markets. And if they tell you they don't have other markets, shop, go to other agents. Because I know in our agency, I think we have four markets now besides FEMA. Um, so it is something that, that there are other options out there. Um, not always are they cheaper. Not always are they a better deal. And one of the interesting things with a couple of those markets is that they don't, um, they don't uh, write flood insurance on homes that were built before 1900. And that's kind of frustrating because a lot of our city of Ithaca homes were built before 1900. So that's going to crimp a little bit of the options we have, but I still, you know, would encourage you to get quotes, um, find out what they're going to be. Um, and, and, and certainly that'll give you a little bit of an idea um, moving forward, um, you know, what you're gonna be dealing with. And I'm sure people probably have a lot of questions. So I'd like to, you know, open it up for anyone to turn their mic on and ask me any questions they wanna ask. I have a question. Sure. Um, I, I have rental insurance. And uh, flood insurance is optional. And I always thought, well, I really don't need flood insurance. I live across the street from the hospital in Cayuga Meadows, which is, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And I live in a ground floor apartment with a patio in the living room. And yeah. it rains, you know, it rains normally. Should I get flood insurance? So, <laughs> The problem, again, becomes the diversion of water. And flash flooding is flash flooding. Um, it can hit any area, and it can certainly hit your area. Um, I'm assuming that your apartment is all on one level? Yes. OK. So you know, it, the problem is you can flood, um, uh -huh. you know, because you can you know, flood is surface water. If it gets diverted because of a heavy rain and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, something happens, uh, you know, uphill from you that diverts water, it can certainly come to the building if, and, and it can certainly flood you, right? Um, right. What they don't cover, so I, I always try to clarify this because this is a big issue. On your normal homeowner's policy or your tenant's policy, the normal policy does not cover seepage through the walls, okay? Oh. It only covers, the normal policy only covers like if a pipe bursts. The only water you're gonna get coverage for is a pipe bursting, right? In your, in your home, in oh. your apartment. So on, your, on a normal homeowners, you don't get any coverage. On flood insurance, it's surface water. It does not include seepage underground, which is hydrostatic pressure underground that keeps pushing because we've had, for example, soaking rains, which we haven't had in a long time. But um, uh, we get a lot of these types of claims in the spring when uh, the ground's still partially frozen and then we get a heavy, heavy rains and the ground is putting a lot of pressure on foundations of homes. And you know the path of least resistance, 
Um, if rock isn't the other options, it's going to push against the concrete and whatever you've got. And if it can make a fissure in and start leaking into your home, it will. Some people have stone basements. Obviously, it's easier to leak in between the stones. So we, we definitely see that. Um, and it's not covered under flood either, the seepage. It's only if it's surface water that's then coming into the home. So you, you have to kind of evaluate what your chances are and, and what the lay of the land is around there to see if it's gonna flood, if it's gonna run to you, or if they have berms, et cetera, that's going to take the water around your building and not really have it run to you. So it's, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, I'm not gonna tell you you don't need it, uh, but I'm not gonna tell you you do. Uh, it's, it's gonna be a choice, um, but certainly in your location up on the hill, it should be pretty inexpensive too, um, yeah. based, based on where you are. So, yeah. you know, yeah. that's, that, that's the hard part about it is, you know, if we could predict the future, then we know that you need it, right? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else have a question? Yes. Joanne? Kelly, I, I came in late from another meeting, so I hope you haven't addressed this, but um, is there any possibility that when all this reorganization is done that people are going to be given no choice, but if you own a house, but to get flood insurance? I mean, is it going to be compulsory? If it's it's compulsive if you have a loan only. Okay. It's So if you don't have a loan, it's not compulsive. Well, does a mortgage start? Uh, does that stand as a loan? Yes. So um, even a home equity, even it. a home equity line of credit is a loan. Even if you don't borrow against it, if mm -hmm. the ability is there for you. So so you you said, geez, you know, just in case, I'd like to have a home equity in my back pocket that if I had to borrow money in a hurry, I could, right? And then I can pay it back. That home equity assumes that you're going to have, let's say it was a $50,000 home equity. It's gonna assume that you can max it at any time. And they're gonna make sure that you have $50,000 with a flood insurance if your structure is in the flood hazard zone. So, so even if you haven't asked for a home equity loan is what you're saying? No, if you've, You've asked for it and gotten it, but you haven't used it. Oh, I see. Okay. So you have no balance on it, but it's sitting there and you could use it at any time. You would have to have it, but you don't have to have, if you have no mortgage, no loans, you do not have to have flood insurance. No, but if and you have a mortgage, do you have to have flood insurance? If you have a mortgage, you have to have flood insurance. So it, it, is that the current situation or is that what yes. you're saying? Okay, let me ask you this. <laughs> when I bought my house, which was about 16 years ago, mm -hmm. um, I specifically asked the bank if I needed flood insurance, and they told right. me no. Uh -huh. Now, I am about 200 feet from Six Mile Creek, and I was not the only person on my block who was told no, because someone else bought a house. Oh, sure. Yep. So has that been canceled out now? Am I so so let me and they never asked me to relook at this. No, actually, let me explain how this works with the banks, because this will make it easier for you to understand the process. So let's take our area as the example, because it's happening, right? So let's assume that, um, the, that FEMA says, okay, we're going to make these maps effective April 1st, 2024. And and let's just say right now we were in 2023, right? We might be, we might be in this time of year in 2023. We're going to make them effective April 1st, 2024. FEMA is, there are vendors that all banks have to use. They're required to use them to be backed by the FDIC. And what these vendors do is every time a mortgage is given, a home equity loan is given, a commercial loan is given, anything, the address of the property and the description of the buildings is turned over to this vendor. And the vendor runs back when you got it, they run a, a check to make sure it's in a floodplain or not in a floodplain. Okay. So they'll they keep record of everything that you have a mortgage on. 
this vendor, you know, the banks pay a lot of money for these people to keep this information. So, and they'll say, nope, it's not in a flood zone. When they remap and they give the effective date of the remapping, so again, using that April 1st of 2024, FEMA will let those vendors know the addresses of the properties that are going to be mapped into the floodplain mm -hmm. and any addresses that are going to be mapped out of the floodplain. So for homes, which we do have some in this area that are coming out of the floodplain, um, tentatively, if, if, it, if it all sticks like it is right now, they will get notifications and the bank the bank will be given notification and they have to have the coverage either by the effective date, if they're given more than 45 days notice, by the effective date. So if they're given notice in October of 23, that this is gonna happen April 1st, 24, they, they just have to make sure all their customers have it in place by April 1st, 24. And they have to have proof in their hands or the banks get fined. Okay, so if they don't let the banks know until, let's say, March 1st or March 15th of 2024, the banks are given 45 days and they must then contact every loan, owner of every loan, and tell them that they have to obtain flood insurance. Now, FEMA, according to FEMA, is supposed to also send letters out to every property owner that states that they're being mapped into a flood zone so that this is not a great shock and that the banks aren't taking the heat for it. Um, whether that actually happens or not um, remains to be seen. Or if you know addresses are wrong or they don't get it for whatever reason in the, in the mail. But the guideline is the banks have to have that proof in their pocket, either at the effective date, if they were given more than 45 days notice ahead of time, or 45 days from the date they get the notice. They must have that coverage in effect, or the banks can be fined. And I believe the first two are only like 500 and, and 1500 or something of that nature that they get fined. And after that, it's $5,000 for everyone that doesn't have a loan. And they must force police coverage. The, for everyone, wait, sorry, wait. everyone that doesn't have have um, a flood policy. Oh. Okay. So, so it is. Um, you know, the banks will be on it because they have to be because they don't want to get fined, mm -hmm. um, and they're required by the FDIC in order for the FDIC to back the loans. So they will change. Um, they will send letters to those that are now out of the floodplain, that they've been notified, that they've been removed from the floodplain, and they can, at their discretion, cancel their flood insurance. And the bank, usually within that letter, says, we, we no longer require flood insurance. So you give that letter to your insurance agent. They can send it into the company with a, sign, a form that says, we want to cancel and they will cancel because it's no longer a requirement. So, um, but yes, everybody is going to have to have flood insurance. It's just going to depend on whether you get it through FEMA or you get it through a private market. Um, so basically it. this is for the benefit of the insurance companies because I, I, here's my feeling like, all right, let's say I decide not to get the flood insurance. I'm sure I will be in a flood plain since I'm so close to the creek. Um, mm -hmm. And I say, you know, this isn't worth it for me. I may not even live, you know, that long. <laughs> I'll take that $4,000 because I'm right near Wood Street. And, right. I'll, um, you know, and I'll do something that I want to do with it. Right. Um, that's not going to affect anybody, right? Except that the insurance company isn't going to get the money and I might lose, you know, a lot of part of my house. <laughs> but if that's my choice, why shouldn't I be? It is absolutely your choice. There will be many people. So, so what we basically call that is self-insuring the loss. Okay, is, but, but what's the bank going to do if I don't want to pay them? If I, if I say to well, them- Well, no, no, that, you, only get to, you only get to make that choice you only get to make that choice if you 
don't have a loan. If you have a loan, you must buy it. If you do not buy it. Okay, that's bank, my question. I have okay. a mortgage and I would have a mortgage until I'm 98. Okay. Then so they would force place. If I say, I don't care what happens to the house. Mm -hmm. I can die in three years. You know, I'm mm -hmm. already past, I'm almost past right with the average ages. So I don't want to, I don't want to pay that. You know, that would be another $12,000 or something. Um, so they what's, would force what's the bank going to do? They would force place because they have the, they have the requirement to have to force place that coverage and the force place coverage typically is even more expensive. So and they would add that onto my mortgage bill. Right. They would add that into your payments. Yes. So this so, is basically a benefit to the insurance companies. It's a benefit to FEMA. I mean, FEMA. So most of the flood insurance through, is through FEMA, right? The NFIP through FEMA. And FEMA is the one that's going to collect that money. And it's going to be required. Why? So the insurance companies, there are companies that are take the FEMA rates and they basically call it working for FEMA because FEMA can't handle the workload of handling all these policies. So you, probably 25 years ago, they did what's called this write your own. And all it means is that insurance companies agreed to monitor, maintain and do the paperwork, but all the rates are FEMA's rates, okay? And so, the insurance companies are just taking care of the claims, they're taking care of the billing, but they are FEMA's rules, FEMA's rates, FEMA's policies, everything is FEMA. They just get like 15% of the, of the uh, premium for, for the company to, to do this, right? The only companies that would make any more than the 15% ever on it would be the private market companies who are actually writing flood insurance from the ground up, call it that, where they're backing their own paper. Um, and so if I look at the history of the private markets, I call it skimming the cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. So the private markets have gone out there and they've said, okay, let's look at all the places in our flood zone. And then let's look at who's really, really gonna get flooded and who's repetitive, right? And, and let's face it, if you are in Louisiana, you're repetitive. If you're in the Midwest, you're repetitive because you're in areas that are prone to flooding over and over and over. In upstate New York, we aren't as repetitive. Um, we're not coastal. We don't get, with the exception of what we call velocity, and that is on the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes does get repetitive because of the wave action, right? Mm -hmm. So, so they get, they get repetitive, but down here in Ithaca, New York and in Tompkins County, we're not getting, you know, year after year after year flooding. Um, so, so the banks, um, as far as FEMA is concerned and the insurance company are concerned, the independent companies are going to be more willing, the private companies are going to be more willing to write flood insurance in this area because they're not seeing a history of repetitive loss. And the private markets can change the rates at any time when they want to. Well, with, Sally, yes. let, me, let me ask this, has there been any consideration in, in looking at how to develop this policy? Um, again, what if a homeowner decides not to do the flood insurance? Why can't it simply be written in somewhere that, okay, if you refuse to do flood insurance, FEMA will never it's, never it's not about anything. FEMA. It's about the fact that if your house floods and you can't put it back, it's lost its value. And then the bank has holding paper on something that doesn't have value. So the bank, you can't turn around and sell the property because it doesn't have that value anymore. Mm -hmm. So the, from the bank standpoint, and this is where the FDIC stepped in and, and started this was, um, you know, if you have a ton of properties that are in a flood zone and those properties have damage and there's no flood insurance on them you now hold paper on stuff you know that's that may never get fixed it may never be right because the homeowner can't afford to pay it out of pocket to do it 
So this is where the FDIC stepped in before and said, no, this is not happening anymore. In order to buy a loan or to have a loan, this has to happen. Otherwise, you either force place or you recall the loan. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And so the company, obviously, the banks don't want to do, I mean, I have had numerous conversations with Tompkins Trust Company um, because I worked there, right? I worked at the insurance division. So I've had numerous conversations with their department because the people in their department are like, but these people can't afford this. This is terrible. Mm. This is not, they're human beings. They get it. You know, they're not here to try to do this, but they're held to the guidelines of the FDIC and the guidelines were put there because some banks went under because of this. Um, Katrina really did a lot. Um, so I'll give you an example just uh, of why this is such a big deal. Um, used to be in our maps that we get, and I could look at our old maps. I could look at the map as an insurance agent. I could see the address, look at the map, figure out it's the fourth house in, and figure out approximately where they're on that block. And I could tell the bank, I could highlight that area and say, this is where the house is fairly much located. They shouldn't be in a flood zone. Bank would take that and run with it. And they wouldn't put flood insurance on it. After Katrina, they said, no, no, no. Agents don't get to make that call. They're not, they're not engineers and they're not, they don't know this. Um, these people can't make this call. The only people that can make the call is FEMA. You got to give us proof that it's pulled out. So that's when they started this whole process of getting elevation certificates and letters of map amendments on properties to make sure they knew they were out of the floodplain. And so now the, the decision making is taken out of our hands. The decision making is done by FEMA, whether you're in or out of a flood zone or not. And it's, it's done based on elevations and a whole 14 page form that gets sent in with the elevation certificate and then a, um, an application for a letter of map amendment if you feel you shouldn't be in a floodplain. But I will tell you for close to a creek in Ithaca, you're gonna be probably in a floodplain based on those maps with few exceptions, unfortunately. Wow. But yeah, I mean, the bank, the banks have no say in it at all, um, but they're required to force place or recall the loan. And, you know, no bank wants to recall the loan. We've had, that doesn't benefit them. They give loans to make money. <laughs> you know, they give loans because they get interest. They, they get nothing if they don't give loans. So they don't want to go that route either. And the banks are taking long, hard looks at this because it's very frustrating for them. You know, especially like our local banks um, that are the ones that have the most to lose um, financially if, a, if major flooding happened in the city of Ithaca, because they're the ones that have the most quantity and values of loans. Um, and for example, in the commercial world, the commons right now looks like it's getting mapped into the flood zone. So all those wonderful new buildings that were built that are not in a flood zone and if they have to buy flood insurance and if they're told they have to buy full amount that they won't just take the 500,000, that's ka uh, I ran for one of my customers. I ran some quotes because he's just off the commons but well, all of his properties would go in a flood zone. He pays nothing right now and he would have to pay $85,000 a year on his properties. And it is physically, feasibly not possible for him to um, charge that much more in rent and get it to pay, make up that flood rate. So it's, it's, it's a very big deal, very big. So, so this is uh, really systemic sort of repercussions. Mm -hmm. You seem to be saying. And it has systemic repercussions nationwide. Mm -hmm. Because believe me when I tell you, there are 22,000 flood communities in the United States. And they are going, their goal is in 10 years to have them all remapped because they're all so old and they want them digital so that they're properly mapped because they can ping and tell 
what the elevations are so that example is if you're on a lake and you own property right now on the old maps a lot of times it shows that you're in a flood zone but your house is 50 feet up a bank mm. from the lake and so your house should not be in a flood zone and so then we we've had to have them go through this whole process of getting an elevation certificate and getting the letter of map amendment which by the way costs a thousand dollars to do that right it's not free um it gets you know engineers and surveyors have to go out and do their thing to pull them out um there should be with these new numbers way less misinformation um way way less misinformation because hopefully those properties will automatically be out where we don't have to go through the whole process. Let me, let me, I'm sorry. Let me preface, so let me pre preface this by, you've given, been very generous with your time. So thank you. Uh, if you need to go, you can wind it up whenever, but I, your, your, your comment there had, was leading me right into a question of mine. Um, I was looking at one of these preliminary maps and like, my backyard and neighbors' backyards showed um, being in the floodplain, but the houses were not. And I was wondering what the implications of that, that meant. That means your house should not be in a flood zone because it's not, and they should be mapping it so that you don't have to buy it. Just because your property is, if the structure is not, it's all about the structure because we're not insuring the property. We're not insuring the land. We're only insuring the structure. So if the structure's out, but the property is in, you don't have to buy flood insurance. That's the beauty. And that's where running these new zone determinations because of them having, so there's three things that I'm throwing a, a lot of terms out there that can confuse you. When I go to write a piece of business or any agent does, we have to run what's called a, a zone determination. And that zone determination now, as of October 1st, if they've been digitally mapped in, or if they have the information, gives elevation information and that zone determination. That zone determination should tell FEMA automatically that it's not in a flood zone because it's giving the information. So the beauty of the zone determination is that it's, it's been done by FEMA in the background so that when we send the paperwork to the NFIP to write flood insurance or the companies that do it on their behalf, they have proof that it's not in a floodplain. So that zone determination is not something the customer pays for. That's, that's a, a, a minor piece of paper that we got um, and send it in. The elevation certificates, when those are needed, the elevation certificates are what you have to get surveyors to do. And then the surveyors fill out this whole thing, get pictures. They have to do a, um, you know, a whole gamut of things that they do. And we have to send that into FEMA for proof of other things. So yeah, it's really important, but if your property is, but not your structure, you shouldn't have to buy flood insurance. And I have a couple of buildings, literally, that the line runs through the corner of the building. And if the line goes and touches the corner of the building, they have to have flood insurance. And it's very frustrating because it's really, it's, it's concrete black at that point and it's touching a corner of the building and you're gonna make them buy flood insurance. It's very frustrating. That might be my situation, I have to look closely. Well, I think what's gonna happen on those is they're going to get elevation certificates and say, hey, you know, let's review this. And if nothing else, they better be giving them a lot better rate because they can get, you know, they can see that the, they go by the lowest adjacent grade to the building. So if you had two buildings built next door to each other and one of them was built such that the grade went up, like they, they kind of did a fill, right? And they built the house up. So the outside grade goes up on that house and 
and it's a, a couple feet higher than the guy next door because of how they built it, he's going to get a better rate because it's less likely it's going to tear out that graded land to get to the structure. Um, so that there's there's differences with that too. So they, they do take that into account, um, how the lay of the land is itself can matter. So, so we've got like um, three, three minutes and change. If anybody's got any last minute questions that we, we can handle quickly, I feel like we should probably end it at, at the time, but anyone quickly? Well, so if if they so want to email me, um, so I'll email you that mitigation paperwork, just so you have it. Um, and if anybody wants that, if they let you know, you can pass that out to anybody that wants to see it. Um, I'll also, that way you'll have my email. Um, I still am, although I retired as of July 1st officially, um, I am still a consultant with my work. So I still have my work email, so you can still get to me. Um, and send me uh, any questions you might have on flood. Um, and I can and try to help you out with that. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that we have a, 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 a tape of this so I can go back and digest some of the things. Um, it's a lot. Yeah, it's, it's a lot, lot to think through. It's a, there's a lot more to it than, than I had, yeah. had thought. Yeah, it's... It's way bigger than I think people initially understood. Mm -hmm. This is a, a way bigger effect on our entire community, whether you're in it or out of it. It's gonna affect building values. And, and this is where I've gone back to the city and said, I, I'm not a realtor. I deal with realtors all the time, but the realtors will tell you, this is gonna be a problem with buying and selling homes if they're on a flood zone right, um, in order for them to afford it. So I think we're gonna see a lot of things get affected by this. Thank yes. you, Sally, that was really, that was really helpful. Really yeah, interesting thanks. and enlightening. So thank, thank you, you all for, for showing up and thank you in particular, Sally. Um, maybe, and I'll send that to you. Maybe we'll get back in touch with you after these FEMA maps get finalized and we have a chance to digest. After September, I might know more too. Okay. Once well, I once they get the other that, those revisions, it might ha be helpful to know. I'd like I I mean just because hopefully some of these are getting pulled out. Okay. Well, I hope everyone has a nice day, and um, and we'll see you maybe next month or or whenever it comes to be. But okay. Um, take care, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.